All right. Well, good evening. I hope that you're having a wonderful week. It is time for our Wednesday night Bible class. I'm going to scoot the podium up just a little bit. I hope that your week is going well. We're continuing our study through systematic theology. So far, we have looked at how Christianity is under the, uh, under the branch of soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. We've looked at what God did within the person of Jesus Christ, within His death and within His resurrection. We transitioned into, okay, if we're separated from those events that happened 2,000 years ago, how do we receive the benefits of what God did within Jesus Christ for us? And we've talked about how we receive that grace, that gift of God, through an act of faith, through faith. It's a system of faith. But it's not faith alone. It's not uh, simply intellectual assent uh, to the gospel truths, but rather it's manifested in certain things such as repentance, which we took time looking at the week before. And so now we're transitioning into the other aspects of uh, accepting or receiving salvation uh, through Christ. But before we do that, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our God and our Father, Lord of heaven and earth, we come before you as your people, humbled by what you have done for us within Jesus. We know, Father, so often we are weak. We fail to meet up to the standards of your truth, and we beg forgiveness for that. We pray, Father, that in those moments that your promises will seem even more dear to us, that we will rest and rely on your grace and in your mercy so that the name, your name might be glorified in all that we do, so that we don't find confidence within our own righteousness, but within the righteousness that you have made through Jesus. Help us to receive that grace daily and to live it out before others. We pray, Father, for those that are in need within our congregation of healing. Uh, we pray for Vicki Fox particularly, and I pray that her leg will heal and that you will bless her and the doctors that are helping her. Uh, we pray for others that are struggling and hurting at this time. We pray, Father, for our health care workers who are on the front line of fighting this pandemic. We pray for them and their family. We pray for our nation and our country, Father. Uh, that we will come back to a, a semblance of peace, Father, that we may live quiet and peaceful lives before you. And we pray for a swift end to this pandemic um, so that we can go about living our lives. We pray for those who have lost loved ones from this virus, uh, that they will seek shelter in you and in their community and their neighborhood. And we just pray for them, Father. Bless us this hour as we come to receive your word and help us to do so humbly. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. All right. One of, the, um, one of the points that I wanted us to recognize when it comes to the reception of salvation is that when we talk about this, we sometimes refer to it as the steps of salvation kind of like a stair-step process by which we reach salvation. I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with that, but it does somewhat imply that each of these steps is successive. We come to faith, and then once we have enough faith, then we repent. And then once we repent, then, as we talked about today, we confess. And then once we confess, then we're baptized. And while there is, of course, a certain element of succession, uh, more appropriately we should think of this as a jewel, the many faceted aspects of the jewel of salvation. Because faith, repentance, confession, and baptism are all dependent upon each other and not completely separate acts, uh, but rather uh, the, the, the different aspects of the beautiful jewel of salvation. So now let's talk about this next aspect of salvation that is necessary to receive salvation, and that is confession. Confession. Now, do you remember whenever we started talking about faith 
And we said how faith within the New Testament sense often brought with it the idea of fidelity or allegiance. You are declaring allegiance or fidelity to a particular individual. You're trusting in them for salvation, and you're living their life in accordance with their will and their dictates because they saved you. And now we come to how that fidelity and allegiance is recognized, and that is confession, confessing Christ as Lord. Now, in the first century, the church was pressured to confess Kaiser Curios, that is, Caesar is Lord. He is our Savior. Uh, he's the one that saves us. But the Christians confess Jesus ha Curios, Jesus is Lord. And that's the confession that Paul says that the entire world will one day confess. In Philippians chapter 2, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Uh, so, so there is this confession of fidelity, this confession of allegiance, but as we will see within Scripture, the idea and the concept of confessing Christ isn't just about allegiance, but also confessing the reality of who He is. It's an audible recognition, but not simply an audible recognition, but a confession of the life that you're going to live. It's not just saying Jesus is Lord, but it's the fact that you are living as if Jesus is your Lord. And that's the idea of a confessing lifestyle. If you confess Christ as Lord, you live as He is Lord. And uh, there is an aspect of confession that we don't sometimes talk about that's, that's recognized whenever we, are, whenever we receive salvation, that we are confessing our sins before God. We confess that we need Him. We confess that we're sinners. Now, we don't generally do that before someone is baptized, but the act of penitence, the act of receiving salvation in and of itself is a confession of our sins before God, of our wickedness, and of our needs for His grace, that we are a sinner in need of salvation. For example, look at Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, with the baptism of John. Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. There it says, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's something we'll look at in a little bit. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him, were being baptized by him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. So notice baptism, repentance, and forgiveness is connected with baptism and confession of sin, confession of wrongdoing. Psalm 32 and verse 5, the psalmist says, I acknowledge my sin to thee, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and then thou didst forgive the guilt of my sin. So salvation is a recognition of our sinfulness before God. And, and, and therefore, there has to be this recognition and this understanding that we need salvation. If, if we are coming to be immersed, if we're coming to receive Christ simply to uh, appease our our parents or our loved ones or simply to just you know, be a part of a social group that we know that we couldn't be a part of if we weren't baptized, then we're not really being saved because salvation is a recognition and a confession of the heart that we need salvation. And ultimately, baptism is an answer of a good conscience towards God, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. But the main aspect of confession that we witness within the New Testament is the confession of Christ as Lord. And the main passage for this is Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Let's turn over there. Paul writes, But if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Notice confession is linked to salvation, and really this idea of calling on the name of the Lord, which is, interestingly enough, also connected with baptism in Acts 22 and verse 16. But Peter told the crowd in Acts chapter 2 that those, the, the fulfillment of the prophecy was that those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so essentially, that's, and this is why I'm saying that we have to be careful of 
viewing the steps of salvation kind of as a stair step process. Um, let me, one second, let me make sure that um, my setting on this is correct. Okay, thanks. Um, that's why we have to be careful about viewing this as a stair step process because, in one hand, confession is viewed as calling on the name of the Lord, and on the other hand, baptism is. But it's all different aspects recognizing. But the act of receiving salvation is an act of calling on God for salvation. God, I need you to save me because I can't save myself. I need you to save me from my sin. I, I need you to save me from eternal condemnation. I need you to save me from underneath your wrath. But notice that Paul says that the confession is Jesus as Lord. Now, that's interesting because growing up in the church, a lot of times the confession was, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Now, I, I know in some ways those aspects are um, synonymous. But maybe we need to be a little bit more careful when we're taking people's confession and saying, do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Now, in order for him to be Lord, he has to be the Son of God, and you have to believe that he is the Son of God. Maybe we should say something along the lines, do you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, the Son of God? Uh, because we must confess Jesus as Lord and live within that confession. Uh, Jesus recognized the necessity of a confessing lifestyle before him for salvation. In Matthew chapter 10, if you turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 through 33. Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 through 33. Jesus says, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Now this is, this is a very interesting concept. It, 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 it recognizes that confession is not just something that you privately experience within your own home and within your own life. Rather, confession is before people, before men. There was um, a movie that uh, I think it was Martin Scorsese made on a popular Japanese novel called Silence. Maybe some of you saw it. And it was about these two Catholic priests who went over to save their mentor um, in Japan. I think it was around the 1500s or so. Uh, long story short, the Japanese were very cruel towards Catholics and Christians in general um, during that phase of history. And uh, one of the priests ends up being captured and tortured and things of that nature. And so he denies his faith and the way that they did this um, within the movie was that you put your foot on a, a visage of Christ showing that you are rejecting him and, and uh, rejecting your faith. And they got him to do this because they were persecuting the, the members that, that he was serving. And so it shows him years later, he dies. And uh, as his wife is burying him, she, she puts a cross, uh, which was his, in his hand. And so the implication of the movie is that even though he, you know, had rejected Christ before these people, you know, privately, uh, he still had his faith. But that is not the faith that Christ demands of his people. You know, we, we have individuals within Jesus' time who believed in Jesus but were afraid to confess him because they didn't want to be thrown out of the synagogue. The faith that Jesus demands is an acknowledgement, a public acknowledgement before men, and then this subsequently is reflected in Jesus' recognition um, of you before the Father and before the angels. So if we confess, yes, I know Jesus, and I am a follower of Jesus, Jesus subsequently confesses before the Father, yes, I know Jacob. So our confession is dependent upon Jesus' acknowledgement of us before the Father, which is um, a metaphor for salvation. And so... Confession is a necessary aspect, of, and so we, you know, and, and Jesus talks about if we're ashamed of him, he's going to be ashamed of us. So, you know, we need to be very careful in how we interact with people in our daily interactions. Um, when it comes to people asking us, well, are you a Christian, or do you believe in Jesus? Not to be ashamed of that and to confess, yes, I believe in Jesus, because confession is not simply something that you do before baptism. It's a lifestyle of how you confess the name of Christ before your community, how you confess the name of Christ before your family, and before the world, ultimately. So confession 
a recognition of Jesus as Lord, depending upon Him, our uh, fidelity and our allegiance before Him, this is what confession is. Now we come to the what is kind of viewed as the final act that we might refer to as the culminating act of salvation, and that is baptism. Baptism. Baptism is where God, as the author of salvation, cleanses the sinner by His grace in the waters of baptism. Now, prior to this step, pretty much every other aspect of faith, repentance, confession is accepted by the vast majority of Christianity. And baptism is to an extent. But the question of baptism often hinges on whether it is an act to show that you're already saved or whether it is an act to save. That is the point of tension there. And not only that, but who can be baptized? Uh, can children be baptized? Uh, can babies be baptized? Or simply those who have come to what we often refer to as the age of accountability? Now, we're not really going to get into that aspect because we've already discussed that somewhat, that in order for someone to be saved, they must have a saving faith, which has an intellectual and a volitional component to it. We must be able to recognize the, uh, the, the claims of Scripture, and we must be able to choose to follow Jesus, things that babies and even small children are not able to do. And, of course, repentance would reject that as well. Now, another question, of course, is the mode of baptism. Uh, is the mode of baptism, uh, what is it, sprinkling, is it pouring, is it, is it immersing? Um, and suffice to say, and we could spend hours talking about this, but I've preached on it, but baptism, the word within the Greek, means immersion. It means plunging. Uh, and that's what the word means. And so um, if you haven't been immersed, then you haven't been uh, baptized. And it's really as simple as that. Individuals can try and think up a, a, a variety of different arguments to reject it, but the reality is if you haven't been immersed, then you haven't been baptized. But what we see within Scripture is that the immersion into water is always connected with the forgiveness of sins. I remember, remember um, listening to um, a question and answer of a popular Presbyterian speaker, and someone asked him, well, how do I know when I was saved? Was it when I came to an understanding of the gospel? Is it you know, when I decided to repent, is it when I kind of overcame certain sins? Is there a specific fixed point at which I can say I was saved? And this speaker really struggled to answer that question because they did not believe that baptism was the point when someone was saved. And so if you don't have a fixed moment in time in which you can say, that's when I was saved, what, at what point are you saved? And so... Baptism gives us a fixed moment and time in which we can look back to and say, that's when I was saved. That's when I received Christ. That's when I received and accepted the gift of salvation. So, um, baptism is the means of accepting the gift of God by faith as we have turned our life over to Him, decided to turn back to God and recognize Him as Lord, granting Him our allegiance and our fidelity. Let's look at a few passages. Mark chapter 1 and verse 4. Oh, we already read that one earlier. That's the baptism of John. It was for the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins. Now let's turn to Acts 2 and verse 38. A very popular passage, but it's good for us to go over these passages together and kind of refresh our minds about them. Acts 2 and verse 38, And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So if I tell you, for example, as a modern day example, if I tell you, you need to, go, you need to do this for this reason. You need to go and do this because of this. Well, as soon as I use that type of language, I'm not just saying you need to do a particular act. But I'm talking about the motivation and the intention behind why you're doing it. 
And so Peter now is saying, you need to do this act. You need to be immersed to receive the forgiveness of sins in order to receive the forgiveness of sins. And that's the pattern that we see over and over again within Scripture. We might look at it this way. Baptism is where the grace of God intersects with the faith of man. And here, within this intersection, we discover baptism. That's where the grace of God is received by the faith of man within the waters of baptism. And that's why Peter would say in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, baptism, which corresponds to this, corresponding to the Noahic flood, Noahic flood, rather, he says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What's he saying? He says, number one, baptism isn't simply a bath. You're not worried about your outward body being cleansed, but it is an act of a good conscience appealing to God based upon what he did within Jesus Christ and within his resurrection and within his death to save you. Now, friends, I, you know, I, don't, I don't mean to cause any heartache here, but if, if Peter is saying, as he does in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, baptism saves. I mean, that, I mean, that is as clear as day. If he says baptism saves, the apostle Peter, and yet we have a religious group out in our community that says baptism does not save. Who is right? And can I, can I justify being a part of a religious group, a denomination, outside of biblical Christianity that not only confesses but teaches and upholds and defends the fact that baptism does not save? That is unbiblical. It's false teaching. And I don't know how to get more clear than this. Peter says baptism saves. He says it's for the forgiveness of sins in Acts 2 and verse 38. And then we have denominations throughout our world who say, no, baptism isn't for the forgiveness of sins. Baptism doesn't say, okay? That is not biblical Christianity. It's not New Testament Christianity. And if you're, a part, if you're watching this and you're part of a religious group that teaches this and practices it, I, I, I ask that you, I just beg you to come out of it because it's not biblical. You know, come to the Church of Christ, come and practice New Testament Christianity, believe New Testament teaching. This is what the New Testament um, teaches. In baptism, the sinner admits, the sinner admits within baptism that he has no righteousness of his own, that he is totally dependent upon the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that he is dependent upon that. That's how we... Um, justify God. Uh, Luke, look, look at Luke 7, verses 29 and 30. Luke 7, verses 29 and 30. When all the people heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. So notice that whenever the tax collectors and sinners are baptized, they declare God is just. But the Pharisees reject baptism, therefore they are declaring that they are just. So that's the difference. The Pharisees say we don't need to be baptized because we're already righteous before God based upon our own perfect law keeping. But the Pharisee says, no, God is the just one who justifies us within baptism by his mercy and by his grace, not based upon our own righteousness, but based upon his righteousness, upon his grace and upon his mercy that he is giving us within baptism. This is what Jesus talks about uh, in John chapter 3, this spiritual rebirth. Look at John chapter 3. Verses 3 through 5. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. This is when he has his encounter with Nicodemus at night. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So notice, uh, being born again, uh, let's, well, let's read verse 6. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and is sound, but you do not know where it comes from, where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, the ESV says born again. Other translations say born from above. And the whole point is that this is an inner regeneration. Titus refers to it as uh, the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit in Titus 3 and verse 5. We are within baptism. We are saved. We are given the Holy Spirit of God. Well, he already said that in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. That's a whole other discussion, but Peter said that in Acts 2 and verse 38. You see the gift of the Spirit. Here Jesus says you have to be born of the water and of the Spirit, the one who is born of the Spirit. So he's not talking about the human spirit but he's rather talking about a spiritual rebirth that is initiated by the Holy Spirit. The agency is the gospel and the word of God, but the Holy Spirit that we are given regenerates us. That's what Titus says in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. We are given new life within the Spirit, Romans chapter 6. And so this is what happens within baptism. We are forgiven, we are justified, and we rise to walk in newness of life. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Let's look over there. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into, his de- into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we might walk in newness of life. So within baptism, we are given new life. We participate. Baptism by faith is a participation. This is what he says here in uh, Romans chapter 6. It is a participation in the death of Jesus. So this is not just going down into the water, but it is a participatory act within the saving benefits of Christ. Not only the saving benefits, but the reality of his death. That just as he died, we too are dying to self. Old things are passing away, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. We're new creatures. We're putting to death the sin within, the old man, so that we might walk within the newness of life. This is what baptism offers us. This is the beauty of baptism. And this is why we place such an emphasis on it. Uh, this is why it's such an important decision. This is why we, we uh, uh, are, are so adamant about it, because baptism is necessary for salvation. Uh, a great passage to kind of conclude with is Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. This is Ananias speaking to Paul uh, when he was converted. It says, And why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So notice, number one, baptism is connected with washing away your sins, cleansing your sins. And it's also recognized as calling on the name of God. Baptism is an act of the soul. It's an act of the spirit in which we, the act of the intellect and the mind, in which we cry out to God and say, God, I cannot save myself. I need you to save me from my sin. I can't do it, God. I need you to save me. And so that's what he does within baptism for the good conscience that responds to the gospel. He saves us from our sins by faith through his grace as we turn to him and confess our allegiance to his son. This is the culminating act of salvation. That's baptism, immersion within water for the forgiveness of sins. And baptism is never associated with works within Scripture. It is always associated not with the work of men, but with the work of God. Now, once we have received uh, salvation, there is another important aspect of salvation that many times we don't talk about, and I just want to conclude with it. We're only going to look at a couple of Scriptures here. Um, But it is this.
perseverance. Sometimes we say we need to be faithful to the end, and that is true. The Bible does not teach the doctrine of once saved, always saved. It also doesn't teach the doctrine of once saved, never again saved. That is, as soon as you mess up, God's throwing you out of the family home. But it doesn't teach that you can just live the way that you want and you're going to be saved in the end, just live however you want. The scripture says that you have to be faithful until the end. Um, look, for example, at Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. There Paul says, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Now notice, if you continue in it, if you abide in it, if you remain steadfast, then you will be saved. Um, Revelation 3 and verse 5, if you conquer, you will be clothed with him. Uh, we'll, we'll finish with this, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. This is a good one. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. So someone is saved initially, but they can develop an unbelieving and evil heart which leads them to fall away from the living God. And how do we guard against this? Verse 13, But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, for we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Whenever the Hebrews writer is speaking of confidence, he's speaking of the confidence we have and the assurance we have in our salvation before God. And he says, when you're initially saved, you have confidence in your salvation. But it's only if you remain, hold fast to that confidence that you will be saved. And we need to exhort one another daily, lest we be hardened from the deceitfulness of sin. So that's why it's so important for us to be at worship, for us to be participating in these classes, for us to be in each other's homes, exhorting each other to live a holy and faithful life to God, because our salvation depends upon it. And so I'm exhorting you as your brother in Christ, remain steadfast in hope, remain faithful to the Lord, and you will be saved. Grace and peace to each of you. Thank you for being a part of the class tonight. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the week.